James Ernest of The Grueling Truth, here with Nick Elam, creator of the hybrid duration format. So tell us, what inspired to create the new rules? Well, thanks for having me on the show. And I'm, a, I'm a huge basketball fan, and so, you know, a lifelong fan, and I grew up rooting for uh, Bob Knight and the Indiana Hoosiers, and then uh, ever since I enrolled at the University of Dayton in the year 2000, I've been a huge Dayton Flyers fan. But uh, it was in 2004 when I was a senior at UD, uh, hanging out with my housemates and watching the Elite Eight play on a Sunday, and, uh, you know, games that end just, you know, like many other games that we see where the quality of play deteriorates late in the games, it becomes very warped, and we're just kind of looking around at each other, you know, saying, you know, it's kind of weird just the way that the game uh, changes so much at the end of games and really just becomes an inferior brand of basketball for the for that final minute or so. So we talked about, well, how do you, how do you fix that? Because we know that uh, the NBA and the NCAA, they, they've tried to fix that issue uh, going all the way back to the 1950s. And, and some of the more common suggestions that you hear is, well, maybe you just – uh, punish the fouling team more harshly, and that would discourage them from fouling. And I guess that's true, uh, but really all you're doing, uh, if, you, if you do that, is you're taking their only option, which is already not a very good option because they have to hand away free points, and you're making it even less appealing uh, without giving them a better alternative. So you can't really just punish the fouling team to, as a way to stop that fouling that we see late in the game. So we didn't really have a solution in mind at the time, but then a few years later, uh, once we all moved on with our lives, it dawned on me that uh, these things that you see at the end of games where, again, you have the, the repeated fouling by the trailing defense or these desperate, hopeless shots by the trailing offense uh, with the leading offense is stalling and playing a very passive style. And the whole combination of factors makes uh, the end of games, uh, the outcome very predictable, where it's hard to overcome even slim deficits late in the game. And uh, you have even really big games and close games that kind of fade out with a whimper. All these things are attributable to the game clock. And so the thought was that I had that, well, maybe if you just got rid of the clock for that last part of the game, then you could uh, eliminate some of those flaws that you see late in the game. So the concept, uh, the hybrid duration format, or which has since been renamed the Elam ending by TBT, that you play most of the game with the clock, you play the last part of the game without the clock. And uh, if you do that, I think we keep all the things that we enjoy about late game play and uh, eliminate what we don't enjoy. Sounds exciting. I mean, I, I heard that it was used during an event. Uh, what event was it used during? So it's called the Basketball Tournament, also TBT, and this is a $2 million winner-take-all tournament broadcast on ESPN. And so it's, it's high-quality basketball. Uh, if you look through the roster, you'll see former NBA players, you'll see players who were uh, very successful in college or at the international level. So it's a high-quality play, so that was a big break uh, for them to embrace the format. Um, and so, again, knowing that you're going to play the last part of the game without the clock, it begs two questions, which is, well, when do you shut off the clock, and then what do you play to after you shut off the clock? So uh, for TBT, and I think this would also work for college basketball, uh, you would shut off the clock at the four-minute mark, and then a second half, and then you would play to a target score equal to the leading team's score plus seven. Uh, for NBA, I think you would shut off the clock at the three-minute mark and go with plus seven. But for an example, for college basketball, say that the score is uh, 65 to 60 when you get to that four-minute mark. And then you're going to shut off the clock. You're going to play to 72 now. So you're going to come back. There's no clock. It's 65 to 60 and you're going to play first team to 72 wins the game. And the idea is that if there's no clock and you're just playing to that target score, well, now if you're ahead, there's no reason to stall and, and play a passive style. You've got to keep playing assertively. If you are trailing, there's no reason to foul uh, and hand away free points. You get to play real defense. When you're on offense, you get to play your preferred style. You don't have to just chuck up ugly shots, and you can even keep uh, getting the ball inside your big guys. And... So, uh, and because of all those things, you might see more late comebacks in games, and you are guaranteed that somebody's going to win the game uh, with the swish of a net, which is exciting. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds great. Uh, it sounds like an interesting way to do basketball. Um, it also sounds a little similar to something that the big threes embrace. Now, of course, theirs isn't... Um, you know, a, a hybrid, it's just all of where you have to get to a certain point total. 
So, um, yeah, I agree. Right. Yeah. So we are. Um, uh, so we're seeing that more and more. Big three, they're playing entirely without a clock. The, the issue, where I don't think you could do that for say the NBA or NCAA, is that if you were to do that and play uh, first to seventy-five in college basketball or first to hundred in the NBA, something like that, the game times would just vary way too much. You would have some games that be over in an hour and a half. You'd some have some games that last three and a half hours, and that just won't work for TV. So I think you do have to keep the clock. Uh, for most of the game and just play that last part without the clock. But, you know, you mentioned big three. And then also uh, we've seen we're going to see Olympic play where they're going to have uh, three on three in the Olympics where there's no clock. And we have seen some leagues like the ABA or even the NBA summer league that have gotten rid of the clock for overtime. So uh, I think we're seeing this movement where, okay, your basketball can get by just fine without a clock for part of the game where other sports can't do that. Um, and I think we should actually just extend that concept one step further where we get rid of the clock for the final part of regulation play. Excellent. So it sounds like you're wanting to go more of a direction like how soccer with their, um, oh gosh, their, what is that, injury time and all that kind of at the end of the game as opposed to baseball where, like you said, it could just go on and on forever. Um, so I, I, I don't uh, quite understand the comparison to soccer. Could repeat that if you could. Oh, I was going to say how at the end of the game, how now obviously theirs is still time based, but um, or like they'll end up doing a shootout at some point during the game. Uh, so at some point, the, you know, there's going to be an end. Where like say with baseball, or you know, if they did it no clock whatsoever, then it would just keep going. Yeah. So I see your point. Well, so what's what's really cool about this, I think, I think this is a solution that, that basketball could take advantage of and that really other sports, they're just kind of stuck with the issues that they have. For soccer, honestly, I don't like the shootouts because it's such a different style uh, that I'm not even really sure what it proves uh, when we're trying to identify which team is the better soccer team. Uh, for baseball, um, yeah, you'll have those extra inning games just go on excessively long, and, I, and I've heard proposed solutions, but I, I'm not really a fan of any of those proposed solutions. So I think uh, this concept is something that basketball and basketball only could take advantage of. And really, the idea is not to change the game of basketball, really, it's to do the opposite, to preserve a more natural style of play through the end of every game and to give us more real basketball during crunch time. So do you feel this is something they're going to start implementing in uh, the NCAA or the NBA in the near future? Well, if it was put to a vote, it would get my vote right away, but it doesn't doesn't work that way. But I would love to see it, yeah, like you mentioned, at NBA or WNBA, uh, college basketball division one, Olympic play. I think before it gets to that level, um, it would need to be implemented at other levels of play, like PBT or other semi-pro leagues, men's and women's, or international leagues as a testing ground to, uh, to see uh, you know, how the, the idea looks uh, live. But after seeing it in person, because you know, up to this point I've been just kind of playing out these games on paper, and then after seeing it in person last summer at TBT, um, it looked great and that all of its primary aims got great feedback, uh, and I'm more confident than ever that it will continue to grow and evolve and be fine-tuned. So, uh, yes, I am very hopeful that uh, it will find its way eventually at the highest level to play. It was a big uh, breakthrough for me also, in addition to that, to just lend legitimacy to the idea that after it was implemented at TBT, that I had the opportunity to present the idea at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. So that's uh, a conference where you, where you have seen uh, different uh, ways of different approaches, either on the field or in the front office, things like that. Things that have been presented at that conference have actually been implemented. So uh, for me to have that opportunity to present at, in February of 2018, that was really exciting for me. How long did it take uh, working on the format? How did how long was the evolution process? Great question. So it was in 2007. You know, I mentioned that it was in 2004, where my buddies and I first had this conversation of uh, you know what here, you know what's the issue here and how do we fix it. We didn't have any solutions in mind at the time. It was 2007 when I first thought of this concept. I thought of a lot of different variations. You know, from from cutting off the clock at halftime to uh, you know, at the end of the third quarter or the last five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, 
uh, using just a, a flat number like plus seven, or actually using the scoring rate from that game, you know, to, so lots of different variations. And, and so uh, it took some time to settle on a, on a concept and a variation that I prefer. And then also just trying to promote the idea, reaching out to people in the basketball realm. And, uh, you know, I, I got feedback that it was that people liked the idea, but they were very quick to remind me that, yeah, you know, this kind of a change just doesn't happen very often in sports and doesn't, certainly doesn't happen quickly. Uh, and so that's why it was uh, really meaningful. And uh, it was late 2016 that, that uh, TBT expressed interest in the idea after I reached out to them and then ultimately uh, implemented it in 2017. That was great, but they happened to be the ones to latch on to the idea because I, I, I knew of that event. I knew it was legit, uh, really good, high-quality basketball. And so that meant a lot for them to be the ones uh, to give it its first chance. And, then, uh, and so I knew that they were invested in the success of the idea, and um, so I, I really wanted the idea to come through for them because they, you know, they had taken a chance on it. And so I was so happy that uh, that it really looked great in its first implementation. With uh, pros being three minutes, college being four, does that mean uh, high school would be five minutes? Well, it would all depend on a, a few different factors. One would be when do you really start to see the style of play change to where teams are really starting to work the clock? And whatever that time is, then uh, you don't want to just shut off the clock then. You need to build in a little bit more of a cushion there. And then depending on when you shut off the clock, then you have to look at typical scoring rates to see uh, how much how much should we add to determine the target score. So you asked the perfect question there. And I'll go back to the college basketball example. Uh, you know, we the, the four-minute mark, is, there's a few reasons why I would like to shut off the clock there. One is that's around the time where you would see a team with a medium-sized lead that start to slow down and play a passive style and then you start to see quality of play deteriorate from there. It also happens to be the last media timeout, uh, so that makes for kind of a natural transition point. But then also, the, the really serious flaws that you see, the, the fouling and the rushing, you really don't see those till the final minute of the game, but you can't wait that long to shut off the clock, or otherwise you're just going to still run into the same problem. So you have to build in more of an untimed cushion, and I think four minutes is the way to go. Okay, so if we're going to cut out 40 minutes, or I'm sorry, four minutes of a 40-minute game, we're cutting out 10% of the game, and we need to add 10% of it back. And if you look at scoring rates in college basketball, it's about 70 points per team per game. 10% of 70 is 7, and so we would add 7 to determine the target score. For high school, yeah, it would, it would just vary uh, depending on you know what, what the scoring rates are, when do teams really start to work the clock. I know a lot of states, they don't use a shot clock at all, so I think this format would actually be uh, uh, ideal for high school because uh, you know it, it makes it, there's even more of an advantage to to stall and work the clock when there's no shot clock. Uh, so I think this could be great for high school. And it was awesome there because you answered my next question: Why seven points? Okay, now it makes sense. So it's ten percent of the traditional score. So yeah, that, okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, because you know again, we got to keep TV in mind here, so we don't want we don't want the games, you know, to go on too long. We don't want them to end too quickly. We need to try to find that sweet spot to where we're still we can still uh, adhere to that two hour window for college basketball games or a two and a half hour window for NBA games. We don't want it to stray too far from that. Uh, otherwise, it's not friendly for TV. And if, if it's not friendly for TV, then it's not going to work. But I think uh, this concept would be very TV friendly, especially given the fact that. Uh, you know that every game, every every championship, uh, things like that, every rivalry game is going to be sealed with the swish of a net. You got to make a shot some somehow to win the game, and I think that's going to create so many memorable moments uh, that we can latch on to for years to come. So that answers how it's going to help the uh, the broadcasters and the fans, because like you said, just that drama, that intensity, the you know how the memorable moments. How is it going to help the team that's losing? How is it going to help the team that's winning? All right. So uh, the and that's a great question. The under the current format, the the leading team has 
almost kind of a disproportionate advantage. I mean, I, I believe that the leading team should have somewhat of an advantage. They've earned that. But I think just having the lead, having that lead, I think that, that should be the advantage in itself. I, I, it bothers me that there's kind of artificial advantages added on top of that to where uh, they know at some point that the, their opponent's going to just start handing them three points where they just get to take, take three points at the free throw line and where uh, the, the, the trailing team's just going to have to rush and not play their best offense and, and hope and hoist up uh, desperate shots. So what you're doing by taking away the clock, you're also taking away these artificial advantages for the leading team, these artificial disadvantages for the trailing team, and I think it's going to make the outcome of games more predictable. So I think it will help the uh, trailing team, but not in an artificial way, uh, and just we'll get to see more late comebacks than we see now. And um, not necessarily an avalanche of additional comebacks, but, but more late comebacks. And it's, it's surprising currently just how difficult it is to overcome some very uh, slim deficits. We saw in, uh, in the game where Loyola Chicago eliminated Nevada. Nevada was down by one point in the closing seconds and essentially had no control over their fate. Uh, we saw another game that really just ended in, a, in an unsatisfying way. It was Syracuse and Michigan State, where Michigan State was down by one or two or three points at different stages and, and still just didn't have any control over their fate. Uh, if we were to get rid of the clock and just play to a target score, those slim leads or those slim deficits, those would never feel as secure as they do now. Um, and I think it would just add more drama to the end of the game. So in other words, it would change it, but it wouldn't change it dramatically. It'll change it from that 1% chance to maybe an 8% chance or something like that, something more realistic, something like that. Yeah, and, and that 1% number that you cited, it, so you know, I, we see this fouling strategy, and we, and we sit through it, and we watch it, and we know it's not good you know, quality basketball, but you know, we sit through it because we think, well, maybe there's a chance that, that it'll uh, change the outcome of the game. So it was very surprising to me to see, after studying thousands of games and, and looking at all the times that the trailing team used the strategy to, to foul and try to come back, that in games where uh, there's just one team that uses that, that they ultimately win only 1% of the time. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't believe that. But uh, again, this is a, after it looking at this over very some robust shocking data. Game. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, before I let you go, we want to get uh, social media websites that you recommend for fans to find out more about the uh, the format and about uh, change that are you know coming and and how they can be a part of it. Yeah, so um, one of the the things that I've done, I've, I've founded and, and coordinated a special interest group of Mensa members who are interested in sports, and our name is M Sports Fans. So we have a website, msportsfans.org, msportsfans.org, where you can see different blogs about this concept and other uh, areas of sports. Uh, We have a really small following, which is fine. That was kind of the idea, but certainly anybody's welcome to uh, follow. And there's contact information for email or Twitter uh, that they can reach out to me because I love to discuss this concept or anything sports-related. Sounds great. So there'll be a book released about this? I, I, w- I would love that. If there's a publisher interested, I'd love to discuss the evolution of this idea and possibilities uh, going forward. Sounds great. Um, any final thoughts before we let you go? Uh, well, again, I think just my, my closing thought, my closing argument, because there are, we do see a lot of great finishes in basketball now. Uh, I think there's a way that I think this deal ending concept is a way that we can keep and enhance all the things that we enjoy about late game basketball and we can eliminate or alleviate all that we don't enjoy. Sounds excellent. I mean, like you said, the more intensity, the more true basketball being played, uh, the better. Thank you, Nick, for coming on the show. Thanks so much. It was fun.